Thank you very much for that introduction, and thanks to Tom and his team for inviting us to speak and for organizing the event. We're here today to give you just really a snapshot of the in Endangered Species Act work we've done in association with the Right Honourable Herb Gray Parkway for Megan's benefit, formerly the Windsor-Essex Parkway. I may slip into that, that myself as I go along here. Um, so the, the project, uh, the, the precursor to the, the parkway was in fact the Detroit River International Crossing Study, which was a provincial environmental assessment and as well um, followed the Canadian environmental assessment process of the day, you know, both, both uh, processes receiving approval. Um, so just to give you um, an outline uh, briefly of what we're going to talk about, um, I'm going to provide a little bit of background on the, on the parkway. Barb will, will speak to the benefits to species at risk as, as a consequence of the Endangered Species Act, and I am going to talk about lessons learned. By the way, these glasses, I don't really need them, I just use them to look smart. <laughs> so in terms of some contextual background, um, the location of, of the parkway is, is in the Windsor area. It's, it's basically an extension of existing 401 where it ended at Highway 3. Currently leads to the, um, to the existing Ambassador Bridge, which is privately owned, um, but our project will in fact uh, take the existing corridor, which consists of a number of stoplights and convert it into a, a freeway with controlled access, and, and it primarily being constructed in a below grade design, so that we'll have a number of tunnels across the corridor to, to link communities and ecological areas. Um, where, where we reach the EC Row Expressway, you can see the, the, the uh, alignment to the left at the top of the, the slide there. We, we've uh, ended up combining with, with the EC row to basically provide a, uh, a core collector design which, which limited the encroachment on the adjacent area. Just a, um, a couple of photos showing in 2005, this is the EC row corridor again, and um, you know, it's quite a, a green area obviously from the photos. As you look along the corridor to the top of the screen on the left hand side, there's an area that Barb will speak to a little bit more in terms of what's happened there, but basically that area was one of the potential sites for the, the plaza, and as a result, there was a development actively being constructed there. Um, the developer basically bought him out because he couldn't proceed to sell the development any further, and, and, that, and that's coincidentally when we really discovered uh, the Butler's garter snake population in that area. The 2012 uh, construction footprint there to the right shows the construction uh, in that corridor um, as of last year, uh, which, where you can really see um, the corridor forming. And again, that footprint was limited uh, to less, the, the, the footprint impact was reduced by 25% as a result of combining the, uh, the new 401 corridor with the EC Row corridor, and, and that in, uh, in effect reduced that impact on the adjacent, uh, what turned out to be environmentally sensitive area and Butler's habitat. This just highlights some of the, um, the key ecological areas in the corridor. This is the, um, the current Huron Church Road that's now the, the, the becoming the, the new 401 below grade corridor. Um, as a result of the EA, there was a green space agreement reached with the city of Windsor, wherein we purchased additional lands that, that are ecologically sensitive and insignificant. And those areas are shown um, at, at the top of the screen and uh, to, the, to the left hand side. So, the area at the top of the screen is, is basically contiguous with a, a drain that runs through the area and is, is in fact a very high quality Butler's habitat area. And the Reddick Street area was essentially an encroachment uh, into the, the natural area, the, the, the Ojibwe complex or Spring Garden natural area. Um, and what's in effect happening is we bought out that street, uh, we're, we're mo moving the homes and converting the landscape back to, to a natural area. So I'm going to let... Uh, Barb, Barb, take it from here, and then I'll... I have a lot to say, so I'm going to be very brief on my background. I'm a registered professional planner. Um, I joined the ministry in 2005. Uh, uh, prior to that, I worked at, in Alberta at various levels of government and uh, came to Ontario, worked as a professional uh, planner, as a, as a planning consultant, and in 2005, I. I joined the ministry as an environmental planner. Um, 
I'm here to talk about uh, some of the permit timelines. Um, really, um, we've had several permits. Uh, I'm going to concentrate on one permit in particular, our D economic development, uh, economic benefit permit, which covered eight species but five of note. Um, some of the key uh, dates to note here are uh, February 2010, when we received our first uh, our D permit, which was a very complex process uh, involving uh, cabinet approval, independent expert reports. Um, and the test of that permit was uh, not to jeopardize the su survival and recovery of the species. And I'd like you to think about that question at the end of our, our talk. Um, the other really critical date here is the start of construction. Now, Joel mentioned this is a, a triple P project, a $1.4 billion project. So that was a looming date, even though you know our permit was issued in February 2010. Uh, so between February 2010 and August 2011, um, we did detailed field work to support five management plans. Uh, we dealt with the uplisting of two species. Um, I see some people in the audience who helped us with that process. Um, we obtained a new D permit very quickly and we, we, we followed all the process that that required. Uh, so what you can see is a fairly fast time frame and that was really only possible, again a recurring theme today, with a strong team of experts and a collaborative partnership with MNR and other stakeholders. So I want to give you a sense of the scale of the project, and I'm not going to go through all of the species, and Megan mentioned a couple of the numbers on this table, but she talked about having captured 1,000 butler's garter snake. Well, let me give you the other number, which is in 2006, we found four butlers uh, in the area that Joel talked about, uh, south of the EC Row. Uh, we found four butlers, and then proceeded to do further investigative work to the point that today we have captured, within our broader study area, 1,000 butlers. Uh, colic root is probably the most, one of the most contentious species we've dealt with uh, because it is a, uh, as the table indicates, um, our project impacted the largest known population of colic root. And as a consequence, the permit required us to do a number of scientific trials uh, in advance of transplanting or moving uh, these plants, and we also had to figure out a way to propagate this plant, which really um, no, uh, re no records or, or, or um, ability prior to our project of being able to successfully germinate this uh, on any kind of larger scale. Will leaf aster, um, so again, a uh, population of under 150 according to the NHIC database in the Ojibwe Prairie Complex, and this is our uh, invasive endangered species because today we're currently monitoring uh, over 125,000 uh, Willie Foster. And you know, we, we quibbled about that. We thought we shouldn't have had to move them all, but in fact, genetic uh, research that we were required to do under one of our permits uh, told us, in fact, that that was a very good thing to do and that, that there was genetic diversity. And by saving all those different populations, we were actually doing a really good thing for that species. So, you know, Megan uh, mentioned some of the innovations in new science, and I'm only going to talk about a, a few, and I'd encourage you to check out our, our newsletter, uh, see the poster, because there are more details about our work. Um, again, through radio tr uh, tracking and monitoring, um, we confirmed for the first time Butler's garter snakes uh, hibernating in a crayfish hole. And through the work of Wayne King from LGL, um, you know, similar to what Dr. Bogart was saying, um, Butler's garter gar snake typically have a small home range. Uh, through Wayne's work, we discovered for the first time that at a certain time of the year, they moved large distances to uh, live birthing areas. Um, moving on to um, the tools of, of, of our work, really the the act, of rest, the act of restoration. Um, one thing to note, um, all of our species, except possibly with the exception of the Eastern Prairie Fringe Orchid, are all uh, prairie specialists. And all of our work is really done in the context of that prairie ecosystem. So really, we're using all of the techniques in the toolbox for tall grass prairies. Uh, we're doing um, Prescribed burns last year, our first one, we, we burned seven hectares. And, you know, unintended consequences, or perhaps a good consequence, definitely, 
Uh, this year, in, in the summer, we discovered several populations of purple twayblade, a, a rare orchid. So we've done a lot of things. We've, we've, you can see some radio telemetry, I think, in one of those pictures. Um, we collect seeds, we disperse the seeds, we do transplanting on a grand scale. Um, and we've also moved great quantities of precious uh, prairie soils. We, you know, in the, in the context of moving um, colic root, we moved 850 tons of prairie soil. And I guess I should give you the, you know, the grand total of no the numbers in terms of the species. This, we completed our transplanting this year and we moved an estimated 250,000 plants and many associate plants. And within our project footprint, we moved um, about 400 eastern, eastern, um, uh, <coughs> eastern fox snakes and, and butler's garter snakes. And the monitoring work is, is, is stunning. Uh, the snake monitoring work, I believe last year, Megan, was 5,900 hours. Something like that? Yeah. So again, this is, this is uh, you know, the, this chaffis area that Joel alluded to, that we found the four butlers uh, in 2006. The houses on the right, um, that was the, the first part of the, of, the, of the subdivision that was developed. And uh, MTO purchased the entire property, included the undeveloped area, and this year, um, those houses, which don't look as good now, they, were, they look pretty good 10 years ago, they don't look nearly as, as uh, intact. We are removing those houses and those houses, the foundations of the houses will become uh, hibernacula and we'll be doing grading treatment to create live birthing areas. The house on the left is in the Reddick area and uh, that house is a favored home, winter home for eastern fox snake and uh, we're tearing that house down but again also you know, creating a giant hibernacula and many live birthing features around it. <clears throat> a recurring theme today is the notion of partnerships and uh, we could not have done this work alone. We have ha worked closely with a number of partners. Um, MTO is the permittee and we've been supported since 2006 by LGL um, as our environmental specialists. Uh, the project is being implemented by the Windsor-Essex Mobility Group um, and their environmental team are well represented here. Andrea Stenzel from AMEC um, leads the team and, and uh, there are many other experts who are working with them. We also have um, on, the, on the ground implementing much of the work is Dan Shab Enterprises. They are a first uh, Walpole Island First Nation ecological restoration company and uh, we're proud that that company came to be as, as a consequence really of this project. More on that later in Joel's talk. We have, uh, we work closely with the Ministry of Natural Resources uh, at, at a head office level during the permit development, but on a day-to-day -day basis, um, our work with the Elmer District has been key to the success of our, of our project moving forward and not posing insurmountable uh, impediments to construction. Many other partners include the Essex Region Conservation Authority, the Ojibwe Nature Center, Walpole Island, First Nation. So, you know, no question to us, the biggest achievement of our project really is the protection of more than 100 hectares of remnant tall grass prairie habitat. I think I failed to mention that I'm a director of tall grass Ontario. Um, you know, we've increased the natural habitat, we've increased the scientific knowledge, um, and the population of our species at risk, and we've created uh, 33 tall grass prairie restoration sites, which will have uh, be protected into into perpetuity. So, um, you know, the test of a D permit uh, not to jeopardize the survival and recovery of the species. I, I, I guess I'll leave you with that question. You know, you know, how do you think we've done? I'll turn it over to Joel. Okay, thanks, Barb. <clears throat> So I'm going to very quickly fire through um, our lessons learned and obviously there's going to be a lot more talk and uh, debrief on this as time goes on and some of these things have already been mentioned earlier um, in terms of uh, your planning of your, your work, I mean working from an ecosystem perspective in our case, you know, we, we're, we did, it, did things at a landscape scale, it allowed us to really target uh, restoration that would have the greatest effect. Um, assemble a collaborative team of experts. Um, 
you know, it's, it's a large-scale pro fluid project. Delays mean significant costs. So we really had to have the right people in place to ensure that, you know, the right things were looked at and, and um, you know, decisions were made in, on a timely basis. You know, we're very fortunate. Our consortia building the project, uh, Windsor Essex Mobility, the construction arm, PIC Construction, AMEC, uh, you know, the environmental arm, very unfortunate that they came to the project with the knowledge they had and, and also that we're represented well by LGL Limited, uh, you know, in performing uh, functions for us as, as our owner's engineer. The other thing that was very effective was funding an m &R position. Elizabeth Reimer um, has been there to help uh, ensure reviews were, were done on schedule um, and that we had a means to arrive at timely technical, technical solutions. Integration of, of local knowledge, uh, also very important and we see actually as vital. Um, Paul Pratt, City of Windsor, Ojibwe Nature Centre, expert on tall grass prairie, has been crucial to us. Walpole Island First Nation, as Barb mentioned, um, you know, that's really a relationship that evolved from the EA and, and one of initial consultation to one of active engagement in, in the, in the uh, landscape work out there. And as well, I mean, learning uh, from their history on Walpole Island, managing the tall grass prairie, I mean, they're, they're renowned in that respect and they've, they've shared our, their ecological knowledge and stewardship with us along the way. Adaptive management, as mentioned, I think a key approach. Um, sometimes the science, com science comes after the permit, so you need to be able to integrate new, new information and, lo and local knowledge as well in determining um, solutions. Partnerships are key. We're, you know, we're very proud of what we've accomplished. Um, even with large-scale project, real success will occur you know, if others build on our work. Um, so we're, you know, we're not in the business of buying land at, at, at the grandiose scale. Generally, the project has presented some unique opportunities, but we're looking for others to to help fill the gap and consolidate the, the land mass out there, you know, acquisition of property, continued control of invasives, management of adjacent tall grass prairies are going to be critical as we go forward. And, um, you know, we're, we're starting that, that process of engaging other parties in that respect to come up with cost efficient so solutions. Uh, timely decision making, I think we, we've touched on that already. So looking, at, looking ahead, um, Stewardship and outreach is, is, you know, we're moving into that now. It's, it's a key element of our permit. Um, we've got 33 restoration sites. Uh, they can't be treated as islands. They're part of a broader ecosystem. We need to maintain the planning. We're, we're dealing with land use redesignations now. But as well, you know, we, we're, again, we're looking for others to, to support us here and within the community and possibly funding organizations. We have to look at, you know, how these lands are going to be managed cost efficiently because they basically have to be protected in perpetuity. Um, so again, we're looking for partnerships, you know, any, any organizations out there that, that might step in and, and help uh, support us. We've applied for an HSP grant through Environment Canada. We're hoping that that comes through because that'll allow us actually to extend our work out into broader areas. And ultimately, you know, the goal might be to consolidate these, these large areas and have an extension of the park or a new park potentially. You know, we've really brought in an opportunity to manage these lands in the area that, that, that were already protected. but but needed, needed some help, so you know, we're trying to move out into the broader area. Sharing uh, results, um, you know, we've had a lot of interest from media organizations. Wild Canada is looking at filming this year's burns. Earlier in the process, we had Discovery Channel approach us about doing a story on the Butler's garter snake. Unfortunately, at the time, we are going through litigation by Sierra Club, so it wasn't the best timing for us. Um, MNR is responsible for, for science, but we're actually going to be documenting and publishing scientific papers and we, you know, we expect other research, research topics will follow along. Ecosystem services, a, a new area we're getting into, um, you know, what's the value of all these things we're doing? Um, you know, there's a big cost, what's the value though and, and how can that be leveraged to, uh, to support protection? Um, so over the next year we plan on mapping that out you know, in terms of focusing that on what the benefits are, and that will help us as well target our restoration activities. I had some thoughts on modernization. I think they've been mentioned already, so I, I'll, I mean, I'll, I guess I'll just say that, um, you know, we see the, the need that we, you know, this, the success we've had and the flexibility we've had as, as essential to moving, moving forward to allow for innovative solutions and um, also to incorporate new scientific knowledge. I'd just like to conclude by saying the project's gone from seeing the ESA as an obstacle and threat to being able to deliver such a large scale and very fluid design build project on schedule, to having significant discoveries and accomplishments for species at risk, none of which could have been accomplished without the Endangered Species Act. Thank you.